Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning. I'm very happy to be again in your very inspiring environment. So thank you for this wonderful opportunity to give a talk about potential applications of topological data analysis to computer vision. Well, for my uh, research background is a little bit different from yours. Uh, I was lucky to uh, experience, uh, well, real life development of computer vision applications during my PhD studies. And recently I have um, moved back to applications, uh, well, at the new level by using uh, well, recent advances in topological data analysis. So briefly, topological data analysis uh, looks for and measures hidden topological structures in big, noisy, raw data. So, well, as a picture, you could imagine what topological data analysis at this particular moment is on the interface between algebraic topology and computational geometry. However, we would be really happy to, well, to extend this picture and include also machine learning and statistics. So that's why uh, your expertise in machine le learning could be crucial for well, further development in this area. So what is topology about? Uh, in topology, we study uh, geometric objects up to continuous deformations. So the key concept of topology is continuity. We deform objects continuously. For example, if you consider well, the surface of uh, a mug well, with, with one handle, well, this handle well, may look looks like a hole in a standard uh, geometric torus. So these two surfaces are uh, deformable into each other. However, if you consider other surfaces like well, this blue ring or this figure eight graph, uh, they're different because we cannot continuously deform any of these uh, well, three objects into each other. So topology is about continuity, very briefly. And well, practical aims of topology. The first is that we would like to measure shape. So in what sense? We measure uh, the shape by using so-called topological invariance. So invariance, uh, some numbers, for example, that uh, remain constant under continuous deformations. So in this talk, I will focus uh, on, well, very simple examples, uh, so-called uh, homology groups, or even in the simpler case, Betty numbers. So these are uh, numbers that characterize uh, the topology of a shape, well, up to continuous deformations. So what is uh, beta zero, for example? Beta zero is simply the number of connected components, the zero dimensional Betty number. So in these uh, three yellow objects, you see they are all connected. So beta zero, well, doesn't help to distinguish them. However, there are well, high dimensional analogs. But if you take, uh, if you consider uh, so-called independent loops. So in the first yellow disk, uh, so we fix two points and consider, well, continuous paths. Well, possibly with self-intersections, it doesn't matter, between two fixed points. Well, it's easy to imagine that any such a path could be deformed continuously to any other path. So any two these paths are equivalent, or in other words, we could say that any loop in, uh, in such a yellow disk is deformable to well, a trivial loop to the constant loop at, at a single point. That's why here we don't have any, well, non-trivial loops and uh, the first Betty number is uh, zero. In, in this yellow ring, the situation is different. We uh, certainly have two, uh, two paths with the fixed endpoints that cannot be deformed into each other continuously if the endpoints are fixed. Or in other words, there is a, well, a single loop that represents roughly all possible uh, non-trivial loops in this uh, annulus. Well, more formally, any non-trivial loop well, is like, like a product of a standard loop. So 
for in, informally we have uh, one well one generator here that's why uh, the betting number is one one independent loop any other loop uh, well could be expressed in terms of that single uh, loop in uh, the more complicated example so uh, a disk with two disks uh, with two smaller holes with two smaller disks removed uh, we have more non uh, equivalent paths and you could uh, easily visualize here two independent loops. So in principle, we have here, well, three loops. So the upper one, the low one, and this big one. However, this big one uh, can be considered, well, in a formal way as, as a sum of these two smaller loops. That's why this big loop, well, is not independent, well, formally linear, is not linearly independent uh, of other loops. That's why, well, we have only two. And the first betting number is two here. Uh, okay, well, you could think that this is a very rough environment. We could not distinguish uh, well, anything useful. However, let's, let's uh, look at the following graphs. So this, you could consider them as character, handwritten characters. So X, the letter X and the letter Y. Well, both connected, no loops. How could we distinguish them? Actually, topology can distinguish them easily by using only the connectivity information. So as follows. So if you take um, that uh, center point, that vertex U here in this graph, or V in that graph, and consider uh, a ball, a disk around, around this vertex without the center. So the puncture disk, or instead of this puncture disk, you could take a ring, an annulus around this vertex. And then we could simply count well, the connected components in the intersection. So it's like we locally boost our connectivity information. So for each point, we could consider uh, the number of connected components in the intersection. And for a vertex of degree three here, you see there are three connected components. And that's why we could uh, well put uh, degree two, associate degree two to, uh, sorry, degree three to uh, such a vertex in this picture. So what does it mean? It means that even using a very simple topological invariance, we could, we could classify complicated objects. So, so it's a form of varying, but all topological graphs, so all graphs with, well, with different numbers of vertices, edges, etc., could be topologically classified well, by using well, the connectivity property. So formally, if there are two graphs, we could answer a question whether they are topologically equivalent or not. And the, uh, the second practical aim uh, of topology is to represent data in some easy form. So usually a geometric a topological object uh, consists of infinitely many points. Well, as you have seen, like a yellow disk contained infinitely many points. But we would like to represent it in a small form that could be uh, put into a computer, for example. So for our, well, at the moment, uh, the word data in topological data analysis means uh, a collection, a finite collection of points with distances, so a finite metric space. So of course your real data, your data are much more real. Uh, however, well, this approach has the advantage that we could work well in a general metric space, so it is applicable to many situations. So a single point uh, here, well, in our data could be a pixel in an image, so we could have many, many different pixels, for example, thresholded by, uh, well, the grayscale, uh, density, uh, grayscale intensity function. Or a single point in this metric space could be one image in a big collection, uh, in a big collection uh, data set of images. So uh, see, this is an abstract point of view, but it could be uh, used in many different situations. So uh, how uh, people usually uh, approach this representation problem? Uh, one of possible complexes that can be built on uh, data points as the check complex. On the next slide, you will see why it is really useful. So how do we define it? Uh, we have finitely many points. And uh, say k points, k vertices span a simplex. If uh, both uh, of a fixed radius alpha at uh, center at these points have a non-empty intersection, so not pairwisely, but uh, the whole intersection is non-empty. For example, in this picture, 
uh, the check complex uh, has only three red edges, but not a triangle. Just, uh, because the triple intersection uh, of the three disks is empty. Well, there are many different uh, versions of similar complexes, and another uh, often used uh, complex is Vittorio Strips complex, which is simpler in a sense uh, because it is based only on pairwise distances. So whenever uh, two points are sufficiently close to each other, we connect them by an edge and also uh, form a simplex spanned by a click in, in the resulting graph. So, for example, in, in this picture, the Vittori strips complex should have the triangle on, on, that, on these three vertices. Because uh, three pairs are sufficiently close to each other. Okay. Uh, so, let me skip uh, the following technical slide and go... Um, to well, the possible obstacles in this approach. So you see, uh, I have used uh, the radius alpha here as a scale parameter. So if we can pick, luckily, a good value of the radius, then uh, our uh, well, data set could be represented by a nice shape. So if I choose the radius alpha, alpha as, as in this picture, then the resulting well, check complex of Vittori strips complex is that polygonal uh, circle that roughly represents uh, well, the given uh, data set. If I choose alpha a bit larger, then well, these disks st will start uh, intersecting each other, and we will get a different complex with two loops, not with one loop. So the problem is well, how to choose alpha. And the second problem is that if we simply uh, compute the original betting numbers, beta 0, beta 1, these numbers are not stable. So if there is an outlier, then well, the number changes and we don't have any stability on the noise. However, there is a, a, a theoretical advantage of considering uh, this homology of betting numbers. So homology groups uh, here roughly are vector spaces. So this uh, symbol star means the dimension. For example, star could be 0, 1, so it's just a fixed dimension. So we could replace all stars here by zero, and then we get um, a linear map from one vector space to another vector space. So if we have uh, a continuous map between two spaces, then this continuous map uh, induces uh, a linear map between the invariants, between the homology groups. And this property is crucial uh, well, to overcome well, the past drawbacks. So, I will discuss the persistent homology. This is the flagship method of topological data analysis. And uh, how do we avoid choosing uh, a scale parameter? Well, we simply, we simply don't choose it at all. We simply consider all possible scale, scale parameters. For example, uh, if we consider uh, finitely many points uh, in a metric space or in a simple case on the plane, we could uh, grow well, disks, balls around when uh, the radius alpha is increasing. And in such a way, we get well, an increasing and ascending filtration of complexes associated well, uh, to, to each radius alpha. So here I have written this filtration in a discrete form, so uh, for, for finitely many uh, values of alpha. But in principle, it could, it could be considered for the continuous parameter. It really doesn't matter. So usually people uh, study it for, well, for critical values of that parameter. So for, for the most interesting. So why, why, do, why does it help? So when we have a filtration, when we, we could simply see the evolution of the topological invariance over over the scale, when the scale changes. So for example, a feature, so a connected component, or it could be a cycle in uh, our space. So if a cycle is uh, born at some moment, then we could monitor, well, its life and uh, record when, when it dies at the next value, at, at the later value of our scale parameter. So each uh, uh, feature, each topological feature, for example, a cycle in, uh, in a complex could be represented by a bar, by its lifespan from the birth moment to the death moment. And this, this bar, this bar uh, will turn out to be stable under noise. 
So the first uh, major result here is that all this evolution of homology, so if you consider not arbitrary topological invariance, but only homology groups, like well, connected components and dependent cycles, uh, well, two-dimensional two uh, beta numbers and so on, when all this evolution uh, can be described by, uh, by a complete invariant, complete discrete invariant, uh, the so-called barcode. So this is a very nice... Uh, survey paper uh, on this subject. It includes actually some applications to computer vision as well. So you have seen actually this barcode already, I'm sure, but in, in a slightly different form. So let's consider a, a very uh, simple and historic situation. So we have a single edge clustering. So here you see points on the plane. So what does single uh, edge clustering do? We uh, look at the disks of radius alpha around, around the given points. So we grow these disks and then over a long interval of alpha, well in this particular picture, in this toy example of course, we have three components, three connected components. So this union of disks has three components over a long interval of, of alpha or over a long range of alpha. So if we need to monitor only well, the one-dimensional skeleton of the Vittorio Strips complex here. And you see uh, well, the persistent components are simply well, clusters, uh, natural clusters that emerge from, uh, from that procedure. So this is, of course, a very simple example, but you may remember that uh, in hierarchical clustering, the output is not, is not a single partition into uh, clusters, but a so-called dendrogram. So this is uh, another toy example for, again, a small set of points well, with exact Euclidean coordinates on the plane. And you could see that well, uh, points or well, clusters merge here at the following critical heights. So you have certainly seen a, den a dendrogram like that when uh, these two these two closest points merge, merge at, uh, at the uh, uh, smallest critical value, then more points join and so on. Well, actually this dendrogram also contains um, a barcode. So a barcode is, well, is the lifespan of each cluster. So here you see uh, if we start, say, from, uh, from this point, the origin, then the cluster of this point, well, it is born at moment zero and it never dies, so the component is still there. So in a sense, this is a technical difficulty. Yes? Yes? So the features you, you talked about that are born or dead, uh, mm -hmm. I wonder what those are. It seems that connectivity can only be born and will never die. And independent components can only die, become Cycles. not independent yeah. anymore. Are those the only two features? Or? Well, thank you, thank you very much for your question. So in, in the simplest case, we have connected components in dimension zero. In dimension one, we uh, have loops or contours or cycles, right? In dimension two, we have uh, two-dimensional uh, surfaces embedded into our data. In dimension three, we have three-dimensional, similarly, well, in, independent, if you wish, independent manifolds. So it's, it's really a high-dimensional picture. So, of course, uh, here uh, illustrate only, uh, well, the very top of this <laughs> theoretical mountain, but, it, but it's really huge. So, I demonstrate, well, connecting components in dimension zero, independent loops in dimension one, but all this theory makes sense for high dimensional uh, features as well. So, those are the features? Yes, yes. So, so our features are like the number of independent... Um, independent standard objects embedded into our data. For example, uh, independent loops, the number of independent circles embedded into our data, or the number of independent spheres, tori, other surfaces embedded into our data. Okay, so, um, and we see, for example, that, um, uh, that component here, that point, uh, coordinate uh, one zero. Well, it dies here because it merges with uh, with the, the cluster, the, the component of the origin, right? So, 
uh, almost all components uh, die, but one one is never dies. And it could be, well, this technical difficulty could be avoided either if we just truncate our diagram, or there is a so-called notion of exist, uh, extended persistence, then, well, it, well, when it dies, <laughs> naturally. Okay. But this picture is not the, the barcode of the point set as you defined it. This is if you were to happen to run some clustering algorithm or something. You are right. One, two, three join before um, before zero zero and two one. Uh, say again. Uh, what points? Two one and two three uh -huh. should form their own cluster. Uh, two one and two three. So the distance between them two. is two, right? And and then zero zero should not connect with two one until the distance is larger than two. Yeah, you're absolutely right. What, well, this distance is larger than two, absolutely right. Uh, you see, that distance between these two points is uh, root two, right? That's why uh, the point, uh, this, this one, the middle point, two one, joins uh, the cluster of the first two points at the critical height root two, right? So, so you're using the one where any pair... Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, so this is well, a very simple single, uh, single link clustering algorithm. So we join if we, fi if we have fixed scale like root 2. So what happens at root 2? At root 2, uh, well, so just before root 2, we have four clusters. So one cluster from these two points and one three single point clusters. And at this critical value root 2, another point, this one, joins, joins well, that cluster. This is because you're using the R clusters, not check complices. Yes, yes, absolutely correct. Yes, of course. Thank you very much for your question. So in principle, we could use any distance function here. And well, I can see the, well, just the Euclidean distance on the plane for simplicity. So thank you for asking questions. It's, uh, it's very nice if I could clarify um, anything unclear on, on the fly. So another example. So here we have uh, not points on the plane, but even simpler case, if you wish, a function. A function uh, on the real line. And the filtration consists of the sub-level sets. So all points whose uh, values, uh, whose function values are uh, not more than alpha. For example, if alpha equals 3, then the sublevel set well, is shown here. So this, uh, well, the, green, the green areas show, show the filtration. So formally, there, well, these intervals, small intervals below that green areas. And uh, so we get naturally filtration. If we increase alpha, then we get a larger sublevel set. So this is a very natural filtration associated to one variable function. So in the previous uh, examples, actually, we have considered the distance function to the closest point in our point cloud. So it was a, a function on the plane. And here it is even simpler, it is a function on the line. So how could we describe the behavior, well, the topological behavior of this, well, very simple one variable function? So we have, well, we look at the connected components of the sublevel sets. For example, at level three, you see we have three components, right? And, and uh, each component has, well, its own bar, so its lifespan. So the uh, component that was born, well, before, uh, below level zero. So that's simply the component that goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, so that infinite bar. Right, like in the in the clustering, so the, the, the component of everything. However, there are two uh, other bars as well. So this bar from zero to six. So what's that? So this is a component born at the critical level zero. So this uh, sublevel set appears here, right, and dies dies at critical level six. So we have a bar from uh, zero to six, and to see uh, there are two more. Uh, local extrema close to each other at levels uh, two and four. 
and the corresponding lifespan, the bar, goes from 2 to 4. So this is a short bar because, well, in, from a big point of view, uh, well, this pair of two local extrema could be considered as a noise just because the values are close to each other. So that's why we have a short bar. So what is the bar code? The bar code is simply an unordered collection, a list of all these pairs, birth, death. Right? So here we have uh, formally three pairs. So instead of a bar code, people also consider the so-called uh, persistence diagram, which is maybe a bit easier to visualize than bars. So instead, instead of uh, a bar from B to D, we just uh, put a point with, with coordinates BD uh, onto well, the first quadrant, onto the real line. So here, uh, the short bar uh, from level 2 to 4 corresponds um, Corresponds to uh, corresponds to that uh, to that value one here. So the formula is uh, here. The details are a bit complicated, but the idea is simple. Instead of a bar, we just put a point on uh, on this persistence diagram. So in the previous picture, we had three bars, right? And uh, here I put two points, two red points. <laughs> Why not three? Why not three? <laughs> yes, uh, uh, one infinity point. <laughs> one infinity point because there is the, the infinite bar from minus infinity to plus infinity. So if, if you wish, we could well, put the extra infinity point here. So that will, uh, diagram will represent well, a small picture of, uh, of the whole persistence diagram. And these details are just uh, explain how to compute it, but maybe I could I could uh, skip it just uh, to highlight that it could be computed well efficiently and fast. So it's, it's a really simple algorithm how to get this number. So these two red points come from well, two non, only two non-zero values in, in this diagram. Right? Uh, and now, uh, before... Yes? So, so you have... Something that lives from zero to six, you say. Then yes. you have the other one living from two to four. Yes. I wonder so how, why don't you have one living from zero to four and one living from two to six? From zero to four. So let's, let's see what happens at the level, at the level uh, four. Yeah, this is actually a very good question. At the level four, uh, so just below the level four, we have three connected components, right? three green components, and at the level four, two of these components merge. Yeah. And one of them dies. Which one? Exactly. Yes. This is the so-called the elder rule. The younger component dies. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> right. So the older, the older component, so going from zero survives. Okay. So we, so in a sense, it is a convention, and in another, on, on, on the other hand, we will, in a sense, we maximize persistence here, right? So we keep the all the component to maximize to to maximize the lifespan, right? Yes, I missed this technical detail, but it's natural task, of course. So, so what what have we got? Uh, a question? So we started from um, a filtration and produce a persistence diagram, right? However, our filtration was built on some real data, and usually real data is noisy. So what happens if we perturb the real data, so build the perturbed filtration, compute this persistence diagram, so will it be well far away from the original diagram or not? And to... Well, to state this form of stability result, uh, let me introduce well, uh, the so-called bottleneck distance on these persistence diagrams. So the red, uh, sorry, the blue uh, function is the original, say, ideal function, and uh, the red function is a noisy sample, noisy approximation to our blue ideal function. So of course, the persistence diagram of uh, this red function will be different. So it will have well, three points off the diagonal, not, not two, as here, right? However, we could define, uh, um, we could define the following notion of distance. F 
for persistence diagrams. So here P and Q are uh, the following sets of points. So we take the whole diagonal, so infinitely many points on the diagonal, plus some finitely many points off the diagonal. Right? So we can see the sets like that. And then we define the bottleneck distance between them well, by the following formula. So here, uh, Psi uh, is any possible bijection from P to Q. So it's, it's not a bijection from uh, points off the diagonal to points off the diagonal. So some points could, you see, could map to the diagonal. Right? So it's, just, it's, it's not a continuous function, it's just a bijection. Just a bijection. Uh, we measure the distance in uh, the usual um, L, uh, L infinity norm on the plane. And then we take the supremum over all points in P and the infinitum over all possible bijections psi. So roughly, what does it mean geometrically? If the, dis the bottleneck distance between two uh, persistence diagrams is epsilon, it simply means that <coughs> one diagram is in the epsilon neighborhood of another and vice versa. The second diagram is in the epsilon neighborhood of the first one, well, with respect to... <coughs> the standard distance on the plane, okay? Well, there are other generalizations, so-called Wasserstein distance, um, distance between these uh, persistence diagrams, but that's, well, the simplest example. And that distance is in the stability theorem. So that's, well, the second key result of topological data analysis, it says, but persistent homology is stable in the following exact sense. So here I state it again in a simple case. There are more, much more general versions for modules, so-called persistence modules, but here I state it just for functions from uh, Euclidean space to the real line. So if you have two functions, f and g, for example, they could be simply the distance functions to uh, some point cloud, some finite sample of of anything in Rd. Right? So if you have uh, two such functions, then the bottleneck distance between the corresponding diagrams is not greater than the L infinity norm of the difference of these uh, functions. So it means that if we perturb the original data by epsilon, so if you have a, a, no, a cloud in Rd, we perturb it by epsilon, so every point uh, shifts uh, by epsilon, or we add extra points, actually, but within the epsilon neighborhood of the original sample, then the resulting persistence diagram will be within the distance epsilon of the ideal diagram. So this is the key result because it allows us to prove theoretical guarantees. We have an ideal object with some well, good persistent homology and a noisy approximation of that ideal object. So if uh, the persistent homology of an ideal object well is good in the sense that it has well we have some high persistence for for good features, well this well the persistence of these features in a noise from a noisy sample could be a bit smaller but still large. So it changes just by epsilon. So let's look at the idea of uh, the stability. Yes. That uh, spurious features will appear close to the diagonal. Is there an intuition behind that? Yes, absolutely correct. So noisy, noisy features appear uh, uh, near the diagonal. Why? Because what, 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 what is the point near the diagonal? It's the point BD with a small difference D minus B, d death minus birth. Right? So if this, well, why, why is it a noisy point? Because, well, the difference between the corresponding local extreme is small. So the lifespan of this feature is small. That's why it's near the diagonal. And I think I have a real example. Give me just a second. So I skip uh, one more slide and show you, well, a real example. <laughs> well, well, almost real. So, of course, this uh, cloud is, in, is synthetic. So I have... Um, uh, so how many, how many contours do you see in this noisy data? So this is a noisy image and we would like to count uh, 
uh, independent contours. So similarly, well, if you remember, we had an annulus, a yellow ring, uh, yellow disk with two holes. So how many independent contours do you have in that uh, noisy cloud? Seven. Well, almost correct. So I have started. Uh, so probably it's easy to see on a larger, on a larger screen. So I have started from uh, an octagon, uh, put, uh, draw, uh, drew four large diagonals, and then just the uniform noise around this construction. So, uh, so we have an octagon, right? Eight vertices, so eight well small triangles here. Now, how can how can we actually automatically identify these eight uh, loops in this cloud? So. What's the resulting uh, persistence diagram produced uh, in dimension zero from this noisy cloud? You see a typical picture, so all, all noise is here around the diagonal, right? But there are some pers uh, persistent features. So what is the point here? A red point in this, uh, di uh, in this diagram is, represents uh, a cycle. Uh, a cycle, well, some cycle in this uh, noisy cloud. For example, the point with the highest persistence, so the most, the most distant point from the diagonal represents a contour, yes, with the highest, highest persistence. So that persists when we, well, we grow disks around, uh, around original uh, blue points. And if, uh, if you could see, well, you could, you could count there are eight, eight <laughs> red points here. And then there is some gap, right? And more, more noisy. Uh, more noisy cycles, right? So of course, there are well, many small cycles uh, in this data and they're reflected here in, in well, uh, many, many red points in the diagram. However, you see, well, we could, we could actually see it. And this algorithm is very fast. I'll give um, a formal um, a statement a bit later. So, so let me move... Um, So that's a general algorithm for computing persistence. So in principle, it is a hard problem because we need to compute some topological invariants, not for a single shape, not for a single complex, but for a filtration, so for many of them. However, there is a following uh, worst case estimate, the cubic one in general case. Uh, with a simple algorithm, with a more complicated algorithm, there is even a better estimate. However, in dimension zero, so counting uh, components, clusters, it's, uh, it's well, the familiar <laughs> running time for you uh, in terms of the inverse Ackermann function, of course. So this is in dimension zero, but in general, you see, it, in general, people uh, will tell that, uh, say that, for real data, it actually, it's not cubic, it's, it, it runs faster. Probably because real data <coughs> has some low intrinsic dimension, that's why it's not it's not up to it's not up to the cubic time. So usually it's fight faster. However, the theoretical estimate is only cubic. That's why it's interesting to find uh, to prove a result uh, to find an algorithm that computes it faster than the cubic time. So uh, the picture you have seen with the persistence diagram comes from that algorithm. It is on the plane. It is based on the Delaunay triangulation. That's why it's fast. However, it's fast, so it, it computes it computes one-dimensional persistence in near linear time. So here, uh, let me just clarify the term offset. So it's just uh, the union of both of that radius alpha uh, at the given point. So O, in other words, the set of points from uh, on the on the plane at a distance not more than alpha, so offset. Offset, and these are two examples of two different offsets. So we could compute well this uh, persistent contours, persistent loops, really fast. Now, uh, let me skip the details of that algorithm. Uh, one more, well, this is now a real example. So I have taken uh, 
some uh, binary images at this web address, edit my real noise, so this is a picture duplicated, copied four times, and then edit extra lines, and that's the result. So we, we see eight loops, original loops, eight points here, and actually two more points on this diagram with a late birth. And they could be naturally explained. Why do you have two extra points away from the diagonal, but that are born very late? So they are born very late because we have two contours in this picture that are born late. And they are artificial. So this one and that one. So do you see when, when I edit this extra lines, I connected this four pictures simply to make it connected. Right? Say again? Is it one picture or is it four pictures? It's, it's one picture, but produced from, <laughs> from four. Uh, uh, f it's one picture containing four copies of a real contour with artificially added noise, different levels, as you see. Right? So, so it's one picture. So this is the whole input for the algorithm, that's the output. So we could see eight contours corresponding to the natural contours from the original, uh, from, from, from this image, right? Uh, but also two extra uh, loops that can be explained, explained well because we have added artificial lines. Okay. And uh, yes. So see, so far we haven't seen any statistics. Our previous picture was, well, persistence diagram Red points, it looked like, a, like a raw data, right? What, what if we have, what if we have uh, one diagram, another diagram? Could we take the average? So how could we take the average? And the uh, idea, well, to introduce statistics into topological data analysis is uh, the following persistence landscape. So this is a, a very recent development. Really. So first we uh, map the original persistence diagram in a, uh, more f in, in a simple form. So we map it uh, as here. So um, we have the mid, mid point in the life, birth plus death over two, and this is the half-life span, right? So again, we get three points, and then we build uh, line, piecewise linear functions. So it's like a shape, like a landscape, on, on this uh, persistence diagram. So I don't give a formal definition, but hopefully, well, it's rather clear. So for any point, we take, well, the triangle over that point, and then uh, lambda 1, the first function, goes over everything, the first maximum. Then lambda 2 goes, uh, goes over the rest, etc., the second maximum, and so on. So from a persistence diagram, we could get uh, this persistence landscape, so it could be considered as a family of piecewise linear functions, right? Well, with a natural norm. And with uh, piecewise linear functions are nice because we can easily take the average. So if we have a really big data set, we could, we don't run the persistence algorithm for the whole set. We take a sample, another sample, another sample, so several small samples. Compute the persistence diagram, the persistence landscape, and then easily take the average. So this is just leverage of piecewise linear functions. So it's, it's a simple object, and we could ask natural questions about, about statistics, rates of convergence, confidence intervals, and so on. And these results are as recent as the end of January this year. So this moment seems to be a unique, a unique opportunity for the machine learning community to, well, to direct the research and well, possibly contribute. So what to do next with statistics? What results would you like to, well, would you like to see? So it's it just, well, it, it happens right now. It happens right now. And yeah. so I skip to uh, extensions and briefly uh, mention potential uh, applications to computer vision. Well, you, well, we could say, Digit three, letter M. 
Well, the topologically the same, right? They could be obtained say, by rotation from each other. We cannot distinguish them. However, if if the horizontal direction is fixed as usual, right, in an image, then we, con we could consider the filtration by horizontal uh, sweeps here, right? And and that filtration actually topologically distinguishes these two uh, these two characters because you see here during uh, in our filtration we have always one connected component but here we have you see, three connected components so even again the simple connectivity property allows us to topologically distinguish uh, <laughs> topologically equivalent <laughs> symbols right um, so more potential applications. So I know that uh, many of you have been working on decision forests, and hopefully the persistent homology could be used as a feature as a split function for decision forests. For example, uh, we could ask how many persistent components do we have in our image, in our data. Uh, if, if one, then we could, for this one component, we could compute the number of persistent cycles, or if there are several, when we go uh, along the other branch down the tree and compute, well, other invariants, well, more local, say, for each component separately, and so on. So you see, uh, this is just uh, an idea, and hopefully we could discuss it uh, in details later. Topological interest points. So edges, noisy edges, noisy corners, branching vertices, if we, if it, so this is for same uh, for simplicity for pixels in an image, right? In a noisy image, if you take a ring around around a pixel and simply count the, con the number of persistent connected components in that ring, we could detect if this uh, pixel is in some edge or in some corner. So we could actually measure uh, the angle between them, or if there are say four components, so then possibly this is a branching vertex of degree four. And even in, a, in high dimensions, if you have a three-dimensional image, well, you may think this is more complicated. However, uh, if you take a spherical neighborhood, if you take a spherical neighborhood, and, well, it is a plane. So we could stereographically project it to the plane, so it is two-dimensional and simple. And again, we could apply the fast algorithm for computing, say, persistent cycles. So we could uh, find here two uh, independent cycles in this intersection of a uh, well spherical uh, spherical ring, if you wish, in, in our data and understand the local structure of our image. And finally, uh, topological e image denoising. So, in dimension zero, the minimum spanning tree is is the object that contains all persistence information. So why roughly? If you have the minimum spanning tree on, on the given data set, then removing the longest edge gives us two components, right? And this, this is very similar to the persistent homology. If we remove the next longest edge, we get three components. And the difference between these two longest edges is actually well, the lifespan of, uh, of the two clusters. So the, uh, in a sense, the minimum spanning tree contains everything. In dimension zero, for persistent homology. However, I am sure that since this algorithm exists, well, in general metric spaces and quite fast, then it is possible, it is possible to do it well for real life applications in, well, in real time, especially because life fast and we could produce a theoretical guarantee due to the stability of persistence. So this is, uh, in conclusion, I would like to highlight that uh, the key features are fast computability, stability and the noise. And I hope that expertise in topology and in machine learning, then we could uh, convert, we could turn potential uh, applications to real ones. Well, especially because uh, I'm here for the whole afternoon and would be happy to discuss more details if I missed anything <laughs> but related to your research. Thank you. We do have time for questions, so please. Mm. Oh, and also, yeah, Vitaly has mentioned he's, he's available uh, the whole afternoon, so if you would like to discuss in more detail, just send me an email or directly ask Vitaly. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, have you tried it with motion at all? Not yet. Uh, are you working with uh, motion? So if you are working with motion, I am very happy to discuss well, what is possible uh, to do with motion. So probably, so do you consider uh, um, a sequence of two-dimensional images or three-dimensional ones? So if you, if you see, if it is a sequence of two-dimensional images, then, well, this video fragment is in the three-dimensional space. And actually our algorithm for computing persistent loops uh, based on the Delano triangulation is still just quadratic. In, in the worst case. So it is still reasonable to try. So thank you for, uh, for that possible application, yes? Are there any other requirements uh, with respect to the filtration that need to be satisfied in order for, for this whole thing, framework to work to get some meaningful features? Yes, an excellent uh, question, Sebastian. So I have discussed only so-called um, ascending filtration. So then our com complexes grow, but in fact, it's not a restriction. So let me show a slide that I skipped, uh, but it works for filtrations that zigzag. So what does it mean? Uh, so if you have, say, several samples, S1, et cetera, SK, from the big data set, it's very natural to, con to consider the following zigzag sequences. So S1, the first sample, then the union of the first two samples, so a larger set, then S2, smaller one, S2 union S3, and so on, right? So this is a zigzag sequence. However, we could, we could still look at the persistent homology in this sequence. So the whole theory generalizes to that case, when we have uh, not, not an ascendant filtration, but a zigzag. And the algorithm, the cubic one, works uh, in this case as well. So it's not, it's not a restriction. Uh, also, we could consider the multi-dimensional filtration. So we have not one scale parameter, but more parameters. So unfortunately, in this case, if you have already two parameters, so there is no complete discrete invariant, like a barcode that describes everything. But there are so-called well, rank invariants, so uh, smaller invariants uh, that do not describe everything, but still <coughs> give some topological information. So have I answered your question? <laughs> yes? Um, here's a strange analogy with my vision, uh -huh. um, that you can see um, uh, large-scale features in a, an obscure picture better by blurring the picture. Yes, in a sense, yes. By closing my eyes, <laughs> And I can see the large-scale structure. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. That's the idea of persistence. So we look, we look for, a, for features with a long persistence. So we ignore, we ignore some scales completely in, in this sense, yes. We look so only for the big features first. Yes, that's a very nice interpretation, but <laughs> yes. So you've, you've talked a lot about noise um, perturbations. Um, the other important perturbation in vision is uh, occlusion, removing part of the picture. Mm -hmm. um, what happens to the diagrams under various forms of occlusion? Right. So from an abstract topological point of view, uh, an occlusion is just, um, well, say, a big hole in data, right, when something is missed. So if, um, if this big hole, well, is not too big, well, I mean, with respect to some, uh, well, hole to no, to signal ratio, right? If it's if it's reasonable, right? So if the distance from the original image to that image with a hole with an occlusion say is epsilon, right? Not large enough, then the persistence diagram for the occluded image will be only epsilon away from the ideal persistence diagram. So we could still reconstruct the features uh, well, it doesn't matter, a noise just a single point or, well, a big, a big occlusion, big hole in, in this data. Yes? Unfortunately, we're usually more interested in the occlusions than the background. I see. So, we'd like you to filter out the background and give us just the occlusion. <laughs> so, you, uh, you would like to, uh, to understand um, 
what is going on in 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 what in what missed part of the image. So one possible approach from topological data analysis is to is to uh, reconstruct uh, is to rec is to fill this occlusion in such a way that well persistence is nice on the reconstruct on the on the new reconstructed image. So I mean that well it, it looks natural. So uh, the persistence diagram well has some features with high persistences and not too much noise. So it, it means that, so I think I have mentioned it briefly, that we could consider the objective function like uh, the maximum persistence. So we would like to maximize persistence. So to reconstruct an image or denoise an image or re uh, remove an occlusion with the new objective coming from topological data analysis. So to, to maximize the persistence. Yes, so well, in, in this sense, hopefully it, it may help. Okay, great. Thank you again. Thank you. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.